I'd like to bring on stage some good friends of mine who have been in the trenches at large corporations because now I want to shift from space back to land and talk about the realities of this challenging enterprise of making large organizations shift, do new things, change at scale inside their organizations new products, serve customers, transform industries, et cetera. How does this really happen? And I've selected each of these people very carefully, not only because they're all fun and interesting, uh, and I want to have a drink with them later, but also because they have very relevant insights and experiences. In fact, in each of these cases, these people on the stage have made it their life's mission, they must be crazy, to make real change happen at big sclerotic organizations. And they've had some success. So we'd like to learn from them on that topic. Now, this notion of transforming corporations, transforming the world, we'll talk maybe a little bit about the notion of a mission of business and making good things happen, and that's all great. I think we need to talk about that. But the focus of this panel, as I've laid out for my fellow panelists, is not so much that. The focus of this panel is what is exactly the challenge of making a large established organization move and change, to create change internally, to transform culture. We had a session before this morning with a group of our collaborators on a change at scale research initiative we're doing through the kin and how do you get the culture change to happen to provide the terra within which new things can grow that's what we're going to talk about today uh, as all of you know who've been to the kin before we do not read bios because one of our prereqs for being here is that you know how to read and you've got those in your books so instead, okay, sorry, Sonny, well, I'll dictate later for you. Um, so I, I'm going to introduce them very briefly and, and their relevance here. So Anna Catalano, good friend, member of the board of KIN. Gosh, we met almost at nine or ten years ago at this Long point. Exactly. And she's been at KIN Global so many times, she thinks she's actually been to more KIN Globals than we actually had. Some of you <laughs> will remember from past events. Uh, so Anna was Chief Marketing Officer of BP under Lord Brown, the gentleman credited with the creation of the modern global super major, and led the whole Beyond Petroleum campaign and uh, took a step back in her life because two of her parents were diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And she decided, one, to spend time with them, and two, to spend time with her children who were on their way into high school. And she said in this career, this high-flying career, she was the youngest person to hold that role in the history of the company, she recognized she had not spent the time she needed with her kids and her family, and she did. Since then, she's gone on to be members of multiple boards, and so she has the board perspective as well as the executive perspective of making change happen. Sonny Garg, Exelon Corporation, he was, he was stupid enough when Chris Crane, the CEO, said, Sonny, become the chief information officer. He said, hey, we need to add innovation to that title. And Chris said, yeah, sure, whatever. And so he is, he is charged with making not just IT happen, keeping the lights on, but making innovation happen at a big uh, utility. Dan Simpson from Clorox Corporation and a Northwestern Kellogg alum, by the way. Thank you, Dan, for keeping the world safe for Kellogg was in charge of strategy at Clorox, a major global consumer products company, understanding how to serve the needs and wants of consumers, managing channels, and all those crazy people in between. Uh, thanks, Dan. Doing lots of interesting things in the uh, academic space with Berkeley now in, in semi-retirement. And then finally, Jeff Semenchuk from, uh, from Hyatt Corporation, chief innovation officer and I, he's going to share with you a little bit about this new mission and vision that Hyatt has for itself. It's not just about selling you a room night. Very exciting. So with that, I'm going to open with the following question. I asked the panelists to prepare their response to this. Uh, full disclosure, there will be questions that come later that they have no idea are coming, and that's on purpose. So blame any problems on me. But the question I did prep them with is briefly describe a major change initiative at a company in which you've been involved. What is the most important lesson you've learned through that process? So briefly describe the change initiative, and that was the, what was the most important lesson you believe that the company or you personally learned through that process? So Jeff, why don't, why don't you jump in? Sure. Um, gets a little bit to the Mahatma Gandhi quote about you're stupid, you're stupid, it's never going to work. Um, about a year and a half ago, the first major sort of innovation, and Rob mentioned, we're really trying to shift from operating a hotel, sort of giving you a room, 
to really taking care of you, to providing care in, in a personalized way through an experience. And uh, to some of us who were newer to the company, we realized that this is an industry, not just Hyatt, but the hotel industry, uh, was created for men, essentially by men. So these were, these were men that formed the industry for largely men who were traveling on business. And it occurred to us that we hadn't really spent the time to understand the needs of our women guests. And so our first major change and launch was we called it the women's experience. Um, and what were the things that we could do that would actually uh, provide care and delight uh, our women guests? And by the way, guys would like it too. Uh, and it turned out to be tremendously difficult to do. Um, silly little things like um, probably most women in this room, maybe by a show of hands, if you come into a hotel room and there are those pretty sort of throw blankets on a bed and the colorful throw pillows on the pillow, pillows you're going to sleep on, what do you do with those? You yeah, throw right. them away? Yeah, <laughs> throw them away. Um, well, we had guys in charge of rooms who said this would be a really nice thing to do and had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. So there were all of these things that we had done, the amenities um, in the bathroom. Uh, that most women actually didn't use because they would pack their own because they have the special hair care needs or whatever. So a lot of little things like this and increasingly some bigger things that just started to make sense turned out to be really difficult to get changed because we had all of these operating standards and it really just took persistence. Uh, we still have a long way to go. Uh, many people thought that it wouldn't make a difference, and slowly but surely, thankfully, we started hearing from a lot of women guests that they started noticing the changes that we were making, and it made a difference. And in fact, for many of them, they started choosing Hyatt hotels uh, when they traveled instead of our competitors. Jeff, what are a couple of those changes that you made? Yeah, so it's everything from um, how we clean the bathrooms. Turns out that we heard from a lot of women guests that they don't think our bathrooms are particularly clean, even though they are, I assure you. Um, we actually did studies to, to, to show that our bathrooms are cleaner than most of our home bathrooms. Um, but it's Jeff, a perception that's not thing. Saying much, I know, I know. Um, and by the way, it's other people's germs in hotels, not, not my own in the hotel. So everything from how we clean our rooms to um, how we prepare our linens, to things like um, uh, our food and beverage. Uh, we found out that in a lot of our uh, hotel restaurants or room service, we had big old meals um, that we hadn't changed for decades. And we learned that we needed to focus a lot more on healthier foods, locally so sourced foods, smaller portions. Um, and again, we found out that a lot of our, our um, guy travelers sort of enjoyed uh, these healthier options as well. So a whole range of things really to start addressing how primarily women, but our guests as a whole, are actually living their lives today and actually would like their hotel companies to catch up with that. Great. Thanks, Jeff. What, what can you say that from the experience of looking at this new uh, set of your customers has been important for decades and we haven't paid enough attention? What did you learn that we can, that we can take to our own companies from that experience? You know, the biggest thing that, um, and many of you probably use a process like this with your own company, whether you call it a human-centered innovation or design thinking, user-centered design. Uh, believe it or not, that was actually very new to our company. Um, most of my colleagues had never worked this way. We were so used to operating hotels the same way every day, year on year. And so this idea of actually starting with understanding the needs of your user, not just asking them questions about what they want, but spending time with them, observing them, getting to underlying emotions and needs, um, was the way that we started uncovering. And I guess the biggest insight that I would say that I believe would be applicable for your companies is that our guests loved being a part of the process. Mm -hmm. So we started with what we called lab hotels, eight hotels around the world where we began experimenting through design thinking. And a lot of our GMs in those hotels were really scared. How, how are we going to, I don't want to go and sort of reveal this and ask our guests, ask our guests what they want. We should know that. And what we actually found out were our guests loved to tell us, loved to be involved, loved to be asked, loved to interact with prototypes, even if they weren't particularly high fidelity, if they were foam board or uh, prototype set of amenities. 
So that was probably the single biggest one is that our, our guests love to be involved very early in the process. So that was a surprise to most people. It at was. Hyatt. It was. Right. Because we're, we were used to um, knowing how to operate our hotels. And so there was almost, um, it wasn't in a, in a mean or malevolent way, but sort of almost a pride. We yeah. know all the answers. Yeah. And I think people were shocked to discover that we didn't and that our guests would love to be a part of the process. Right. Jeff, I want to come back to yeah. you later on and ask you a little bit about this bigger mission yeah. that your CEO, your leadership team, and the board signed off on. It's very exciting. So, Dan, your thoughts about a big change initiative. I know you've, you've got battle scars from a few. <laughs> tell, tell us about one and what you learned from it. Um, well, you know, I, uh, I don't follow directions very well. So I actually went through, so I, I'm one of the unusual ducks that um, joined a company out of graduate school here at Kellogg and stayed there 34 years. Um, and so I spent uh, the last 22 of those reporting to the chief executive, so I have seen lots of stuff over the years. So um, rather than one thing, I went back and th thought through, like, what are the, the three biggest change efforts that we have been involved in over that kind of period? Um, and the, the three ones, and these are all kind of multi-year efforts. Um, one is that we centralized our functions. So we used to be, we used to run as independent operating units, and we really um, decided to centralize functions for a whole variety of reasons and make the, in, the central functions much more um, important. Um, and, and it's not just about efficiency, it's about um, capabilities across the organization. Um, that was a tough change effort. Um, a second one is we kind of redesigned how we go to market with our customers. And for consumer packaged goods companies, that's retailers, which would be Target and Walmart and those kind of folks. Um, and we took, like, totally reconfigured how we went to market with our customers, um, and that was a multi-year change effort as well. Um, the third one was um, in our R&D organization. We, like most other companies, used to be kind of a closed R&D organization, which is like, we know everything about our customers, and we, we want to protect our secrets. Um, and we really moved to a much more open innovation R&D environment. Um, and that was a difficult change as well. Um, people feel in the organ or in organization feel threatened, and how do you deal with, with that along the way? Um, so then I, then I thought through those, and, and there are, in fact, some common themes. So things that we learned, not necessarily learned because we did them really well, um, but things that we, some things we did well, some things we screwed up along the way, um, which is also a great learning experience. Um, and you know, it's easy to, you know, the basic change effort process, it's easy to say, you know, make the case for change is important and metrics and milestones are important. But I, I tried to think through things that we learn which you don't necessarily find in a book. Um, and one of those is um, managing the, the pace of change and the capacity of your organization. Because um, one of the things, that, one of the jobs of leadership, I think, is to manage the kind of rubber band stretch between how fast you can change, um, and if it, you obviously want some stretch, but if you stretch the rubber band too far, and we have done it in a couple of cases, you actually kind of disable the organization. Um, and so one of the things in managing the capacity is when we embarked on major change efforts, making conscious decisions about what we are not going to do. So things, we have to create capacity someplace, and we didn't start out that way. Um, but we learned pretty quickly that if you're embarking on a significant change efforts, those resources, it isn't just the people working on the, the project, it just affects the whole organization. Um, and making some conscious choices of initiatives we were gonna delay, things that we were gonna postpone, or things we could just cancel uh, to create capacity in the organization turned out to be far more important than, than we, initially, we initially thought it was. Um, so it's like doing fewer things, doing better, um, so making conscious choices about what not to do. The second thing is there's a, there's a sense that, you know, change is a, comes down from the top of the organization and the senior people are the most important. That's not my experience, even having reported to the CEO for 20, more than 20 years. Um, the biggest change agents are in the middle of the organization. There are people who are closest to what's really happening because the folks at the top organization just kind of sit at the top of the organization. They, and they, as much as they try, um, they, it's just very difficult for them to actually get to change happen. Change does not happen at the top of the organization. It happens in the middle of the organization. So you, you really need champions that are in the middle of the organization who are there kind of every day making things happen. Um, and we didn't think about that consciously. We do now. Um, 
But it was clear in the cases which distinguished success from failure, that was one of the biggest, that was one of the biggest things. Um, so, the, Dan, Dan, during our pre-session this morning, Michael Warsaw from Johnson Controls made the comment that this change thing is like, sort of like cooking a steak. Because you can get the top and maybe the bottom to get nice and warm, but you get that ice cold center. And getting the center just right is, is a huge challenge. So what are some things you do to, to get the center of the steak right? You know, part of it, in, in our case, in the, in the case of the Open Innovation Organization, um, when we try to make the R&D change, uh, if the senior leadership is, is constantly communicating, you know, about what the objective is and painting this picture of a brighter future, and it isn't as though you uh, get people in the middle of the organization, uh, it was like, you are in charge, you are now the champion. It is they start to get it, and they, they, start, to take, they start to take it on, on themselves. Um, and so the role of the senior leadership team is to actually to motivate and communicate and get people to really kind of own it in the middle of the organization. Um, and then they will run on their own. Once you, know, once you have believers um, in those efforts uh, in the middle of the organization, then then's when things happen. And, it, and it's, it's, you can't really mastermind it, but it is just, it's just lots of can communication. Can you see it though, or the things you can do to, you know, like, like what? I mean, would you call somebody into your office and threaten them, or you know, what do you do? No, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and part of it, is, it's part of it is, is is the brighter future, and part of it is actually giving the senior leadership, um, you know, to really get into the conversations with people who are literally three and four and five levels down, and and you do that with lunches, you do it with visits. I mean, our CEO, which has you know, dined with the CEO, which anybody in the organization could sign up for and do, um, and it's that. Because this this notion of like the top down communication just doesn't it, it's you you really got to reach much lower than you than you think. And fortunately, you know, electronic communications, all that stuff makes it easier to do that. But it's really face to face stuff. It's really just getting out there um, with the senior people, reaching down not to the VPs, the directors, but the managers and junior managers and lab scientists. I imagine when people at that level get these calls and spend the time. It's, it's unusual, it's outside the normal experience, and, it, and it's probably quite motivating. They say that he's or she has spent the time to do that by itself is motivating. Oh yeah, right, absolutely, absolutely true. And you know, the, the CEO I spent the last seven years working for was just like the master of names. And he, he, re, he could remember people's names, which I have no skill at whatsoever. But he would, you know, so he would walk through the lab and he would like remember the name of the lab assistant. And that person was walking on air for you know a long time after that because, um, and it just it, it's that it's the connection into the middle of the organization which I think is just it turns out to be more important than we would have thought. We were kind of thinking about this like stuff scales down from the top. That's not my experience. Right. Thanks, Dan. So Sunny, uh, Exelon. You you've said many times that Exelon or utilities in general are one of the few places that. So Thomas Edison, if he were alive today, could run Exelon. Not that much has changed. How many companies are in that situation? So you're in, a, you're in the context of change never before seen in your industry. Tell us a little bit about that and, and then how you make change happen in that context. Sure. Uh, um, yeah, I always joke, you know, if you brought back Alexander Graham Bell, you have no idea what the iPhone was, but really Thomas Edison, Sam Insel, they could run Exelon today, change that little. Um, I think we'll talk more about sort of where our industry is going. I want to talk a little bit more about the change and some of the change sure. principles that, and build on what well, you were talking about, Dan. So, you know, my career there has been one of just going into different departments and helping them through big change, um, whether that's centralizing all the, all the uh, functional areas like you're talking about. Um, I went in, I ran a, our non-nuclear generation, kind of moved us away from coal to low carbon gas and renewables in an IT world now kind of changing us from this traditional sort of centralized model to a distributed consumer driven. And I would say there's six things that I've learned that I think are important when you're driving change within a big company. One is your own personal narrative. Um, going back to the idea of executives, we live in ivory towers. They don't, people don't really know who we are. They hear stories about us. There may be a few people who can speak to who we are, but a lot of that is just, you know, myth or anecdote. And so, as I always think about it as like running for public office. The first thing you need to do if you're running for public office is you have to have a narrative. People have to know what motivates you as a person. So if you're going to bring in and you're going to be driving change as an within the organization, 
they have to understand who you are and what's motivating you because otherwise they're not going to follow you. It's not just, you know, they're not just going to follow you because of your title and if they do, you're going to make a big mistake. Two is reaching out to others as you were saying, get the input from the organization. We did a lot of crowdsourcing. The, the beauty is now there's so many tools you can use to get input from people. It's not just surveys, it's, you know, it's crowdsourcing, throwing out questions, letting them iterate on those, let them vote on ideas. You know, we were able to come up with nine really good ideas within IT by just asking our employees three different questions and we took the top three. Whatever they ended up being, we took the top three in each of those questions and just said, we're gonna go execute those. Um, three is the emotional piece is really important. Uh, people have been through a lot of change before and most of their stories will tell you that they don't feel like they were treated well. So you have to acknowledge that and acknowledge what they've been through before, before they're gonna follow you to do something different again. And so really, we, and we do that with humor. So we've done, we do skits. Um, we do online like little animated videos that are just goofy. So one of the big things in our culture was, well, going to innovation and change. Was every time I raise my hand and I say I wanna change something, I get killed, you know? And so, and that was just an underlying narrative in our company and so we did an animated video that had this person standing there and saying hey Dan I got this idea he's by the water cooler and Dan's like what's your idea he goes I don't want to share my idea I'm worried I'll get in trouble and he goes no tell me your idea so they start talking two other people come out and they're like what's going on and Dan's like oh Sonny's got a great idea and they're like what's your idea and then two minutes later a big wall comes down they go away an anvil falls on my head right <laughs> but it was just a simple way to recognize what the experience was and so it's, it's almost like being in a relationship that you almost have to acknowledge what the person has been through in their last dating session and who they dated last in order to get to the, to the new, right? But you, if you don't deal with that, it can be really hard to make the change. Um, four is this idea of loud statements of change and just kind of signaling to the organization you're gonna go do it differently and showing them that you're gonna go do it differently. So, and I know one of my uh, colleagues is up in the, in the row up there and I always tell this story and I, I, I make it so it works for me and he thinks it's a, there's a different truth here, but I'm gonna, he doesn't have the mic right now, so. Um, Brian, get but, ready. But you know, <laughs> I wanted to show the IT department, hey, we wanna go change, and so I came in and said, look, I'm gonna go buy a MacBook Air, I want it to work, because in big IT departments and big companies, everybody's like, you can't bring your own laptop. It's going to destroy the network. Everything's going to blow up. The, the whole place is going to shut down, right? Electricity will be shut down in Illinois. And I just asked for, I said, okay, well, uh, who can help me do this? And most people are like, we can't do it. And Brian stood up and said, I know how to do that. I've been working on that forever. We're like, great, you know, come on in. You get to run IT strategy. And now he's running our emerging technologies team. So, they, you know, they have to see you act in a way that's different than the, in the past, but in a loud, very obvious, visible way. Two other quick ones, really. Um, actually, the, the last one is this idea of social capital and, and getting into the middle of the stake. Um, one of one things that we've done is is formalize that grapevine. So we did, I did this at Exelon Power. We were shutting down all of our coal plants. Here I am, a corporate guy. I've never been out in a power plant. There's no way they're going to trust me. Uh, how do you how do you build up that that trust? You're going to need to make a big change. We use the existing social capital. So there are people throughout the organization that don't have high titles, um, that they're the informal leaders. And you find those folks. You find Dan, and Dan's a guy that anytime something's going on in the company, everybody goes to Dan and says, Dan, what's really going on? And Dan can either be really good, or Dan can be Cliff Clavin sitting at the bar, cheers. Right, you know, like, and, and kind of making stuff up. So if you can get Dan to be your ally and understand it, he can affect 20, 30, 40, 50 people that he's been working with for 10, 15, 20 years, and they will listen to Dan much more than they listen to you. So can you find those folks? We've always done it informally, now we're doing more around social network analysis, Great. even email analysis, what are people doing? So you can begin to understand who are those points of influence, tap into them, and they become your messengers for change, and bring them under the tent, and they will do unbelievable things for you and, and accelerate your change in a way you never thought possible. You know, Sonny, everybody will, in innovation will spend a lot of time on the product development plan or the technology plan or hopefully some time with customers trying to understand them, but people don't spend enough time on the human plan, meaning that internal organizational engagement plan. And, and my perspective is it, that needs to be as intentional as the development plan, meaning it's on your, if you're part of this team, it's on your objectives list, 
you have to report back, how's it going, engaging with what's her name in this department, how's it going with marketing, are they, are they coming around? It can't just be, well, I had a conversation at the water cooler, let's talk about it. But it's an intentional part of your development process, that human plan. And I have to say, when Sonny, you, you underemphasized it, I, I want to underscore this notion of the top three. When Sonny mentioned we took a poll of all the IT professionals at Exelon and said, what are your most critical challenges? What are the things that could make you better if we fixed it? They, they actually did that, and they came up with three things that, that popped up over and over and over again, and, and that's how they decided what to spend a lot of time, money, and effort on over a year or so to, to fix. And, and I was just at an event with sort of mid-senior level leadership, Sonny's team, uh, last week, a week before perhaps, and one of the change efforts that came up it was, was a little bit challenging, and people were arguing about it, and it was great to be able to see Brian say, Brian Hoff in the back, yeah, we, we get that, but you know what? This is one of the three things that came up from the thousands of people in our organization at Exelon over and over again. You told us that this was important, and some other people stood up for it in that meeting and said, you know what, yeah, if we could figure this out, that's really important. So that, that was a powerful, powerful way. It was not top down. It was really listening to the middle of the stake. Anna Catalano, so you're, you're at the board level now. You've been in the, the leadership team of large corporations. Now you're at the board level of a number of global companies. So what, what's, what's an example of an initiative you've been through and what you learned from that? You know, I, I see it, the most difficult thing about being the fourth one is that you're not supposed to repeat any of the things that everyone else has said. So I'm sitting here ticking off mentally. Okay, that's, that's been said. That's been last, said. Anna, Thank you very I much. I know you have something to say. Um, you know, the, the one thing that, that I, I can draw upon from my experience at, at BP where we did a wholesale change of kind of what the company stood for and what it was about which also, by the way, included strategic shift in all of the businesses about where does strategy originate rather than originating at the wellhead or at the refinery. Strategy actually needs to originate from the outside in. The one thing that, that I've learned over time is that the thing that, that leadership needs to create is a change perspective. So change doesn't happen easily when people's perspective remains the same. And, and particularly in big corporations, I mean, in, in the oil industry, this is certainly true. You know, in a lot, in, in obviously in your industry, it sounds like if, if, if Thomas Edison can run your company, it, it sounds like it's true. Uh, Don't tell if, the other if people, no, I won't, I won't. Don't, nobody tweet that. Um, oh, wow. If, if, <laughs> oops. If, um, if you don't change people's perspective on the situation, on the world, on new information, it's very, very difficult to get people to change their minds about what to do. And what I found in the oil industry, especially, is um, it's very comfortable for people to kind of do the same thing every day and not want to change. Because in big corporations, your perspective doesn't have to change, and you can have a very comfortable day at work. And so one of the things that change leaders have to try and figure out how to create is what's the different perspective. In companies like, in companies like me, Johnson, where I sit on the board, it's actually really important when we talk about creating infant nutrition in developing countries for people to really understand what the developing country is like. I mean, how do people go about creating opportunities for people to, to get nutrition for their children? What are the issues in the country that get in the way of making that happen? And it's really important. We've taken our board members to different countries to make sure that the board has an idea of a different perspective. And so, you know, I think one of the most important things that we can do is make sure that people kind of get out of their comfort zone, get out of the things that make them do what they do, and realize that if they change perspective, that, that creates an opportunity for people to, to kind of come up with new ideas. So I, I relate this to something you said a few years ago I'd never heard before, and I've used it many times, with attribution, by the way. And, and that is the larger your company, the smaller your world. So I talk, about, I talk about people operating in orbits. Some of you who have heard me talk about this have heard me use the word. When I worked in a corporate environment, I, you know, it's, it's really neat. You travel around a corporate environment, you, you meet people, and everyone you meet works for a corporation, and you kind of feel pretty cool because you know a lot of people. And then you leave, and you realize there are people who are in totally different orbits than you that you would never meet because, by definition, an orbit kind of stays on the same path, right? And, and when the bigger the company, the harder it is because it's very easy to just keep meeting people in the same orbit. I've often commented to Rob, had I not left the corporate world and, and do what I do now, that is kind of a, a mishmash of many different things, 
he and I would never have met because we would never have had a reason to meet. And, and getting people out of that comfort zone to meet people that they otherwise would never run into is the value of organizations like Kin. You are gonna meet people in the next three days that are in totally different orbits than you normally are in, which makes the world very interesting. Great, so I, I'd like to cue off that question. In a little bit, I'll open it to the room. When I do that, bear with us, I hate when people have to wait for a microphone. I hate it when someone has to run around and hand the microphone and then somebody gets on their soapbox and it, it just blows the whole mood. So I'm gonna try and take a couple questions from the room in a little bit and a couple of guidelines. First of all, talk very loudly. I will repeat the question if need be. Second, no comments posing as questions. These are the people to whom we are providing the questions. In any case, the question I would like to provide builds on that and that is, let's say you believe, you and some of your colleagues believe that there's a major change that needs to happen at Hyatt or Clorox or Exelon or Mead Johnson or Willis Group or wherever. But the rest of the leadership team maybe isn't there. Maybe the CEO isn't even there. What do you do? Nothing. All right. To the room. <laughs> What do you do? How do, how do you bring colleagues along? You're, you're in a senior level at this point. You believe something needs to change, but most of the leadership team isn't there yet. What do you do? So there, um, we're in the middle of um, an initiative now that is how, how do we actually fund what we do as, as a hotel company. So um, we manage hotels on behalf of other owners. We franchise. We own a number of our own. And um, essentially, we, we're we charge a tax, it's a way to think about it, to these owners for, for running a hotel. Everything from getting reservations to, to generating revenue to on-site property management. And um, so we've done two things. We've treated this as a major change initiative to say we have to fund and allocate differently. And we've done two things. We've, we've gone out to our owners, back to this idea of going out to your users, and ask them, somebody said, um, Sonny, I think you talked about it, that you have to be emotional. This isn't sort of just analytical. And for years and years and years, we've treated this as a very analytical exercise. And we actually got to a much deeper level with our owners to get to things like, I'm frustrated. This is opaque. You never listen to me. Um, and you know, we've, we've thought we've been doing a good job. So in this case, it's actually this outside perspective that's, that's getting people to listen. And then um, a little bit to this multiple orbit, orbits and, and maybe at the middle of the stake, um, it's a very diverse team. It's not the usual suspects. So it's somebody from finance, it's somebody from owner relationships, it's somebody from branding. And these emerging leaders um, who see the world actually very differently are coming forward with a very different voice. We don't have to keep doing this the way we've been doing it for 20 or 30 years. So the combination of, in this case, our, our customer, our owner, and, and a different set of internal leaders, some of whom come from, from the HLF that you were a part of, Rob and, and Mohan, um, and they're saying there's a very different way we could do this. I, I think another thing that you can do is um, you, you need to step back and paint a picture of what could the future look like. And I think that, you know, taking it from the present in terms of what's going on in performance, how are we doing, what are we measuring, you know, things like that, and actually taking a step back and say, you know what, let's talk about what the world's going to look like in 10 years. Let's talk about what it's going to look like in 20 years. Actually takes the danger out of the conversation because, you know, heck, who knows what's, what it's going to look like. But it begins the process of a different way of thinking about your business. And when you talk about what's the world going to look like in 20 years, it makes it very easy to talk about new needs, new competitors, new technologies, new things emerging that makes it very safe to kind of think out of the box rather than have it done against a quarterly result that someone is driving for. So I think that you know, doing something like that and, and having strategic conversations around long term, what's this world going to look like is a really good place to start. Part of Dan. You know, part of the convincing uh, management team that may not be convinced yet is, you know, two things. One is kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations, right? Because there's, you make some assumptions about who's on board and who's not. Sometimes those aren't true at all. Um, and just asking for feedback, you really need to understand the, 
the details of the political landscape at a fairly granular level. Yeah. And the more you listen, the more you have those one-on-one -on -one conversations, the, the, the clearer it will be uh, how to navigate that in a way that works. Um, and the second thing is, um, you know, what design people would call rapid prototyping, which is like, say you have all these conversations and you still don't have a lot of support, go find a place to try it. I mean, in our, we have 13 business units in our organization, um, and there's always one who is willing to, you know, regardless of what the idea is, try it on a small scale. Uh, and because if you can get it to work on a small scale, then it's like the doubters start to say, it's like, ah, oh, maybe that's not so crazy after all. Um, so it just, you know, get it, get it started somehow, and then just kind of continually check in with the political landscape. Um, and it, it moves, it does, it works. Great, sign, Andrew? No, I mean, I would just add that um, it depends on the, the scale of change you're trying to affect and how quickly. I mean, if you're trying to change the strategy of the company, that's a different sort of, um, yeah. you know, a certain different challenge, right? If you're trying to, like for Exelon, we're saying, how much do we get into distributed? How, you know, how long is this centralized model gonna be here? And if we do go kind of 20 years out and you back cast, generally you're always wrong about the pace of change. You start at least thinking about it, but it's always hard, to, it's not, it always happens faster than you think. But that's a conversation that I, you know, I, I think that's a different conversation and how you influence that is different than if you're just trying to, like, we're trying to drive innovation within our culture. We think of our team as sort of, we've got this small team of 15 people and they're just kind of an entrepreneurial shop. To me, they're like a startup. Yeah. And so they have to go and do the same thing that startups do, right? They go to, A, they go to where they're wanted. So don't go to, a, like you were saying, there's 13 divisions. Excellent, we've got 26,000 employees. We can find somebody who's interested in something we're going to go do, right? And then you kind of build a little momentum. You show success. You show that it can work. And then it's, so it's the same thing as crossing the chasm, right? I mean, you're starting small. You've got your early adopters. Find those within the company. Get them on your side. And then other people will jump in. Right? So it's that 20, 60, 20 distribution. Find that 20% who's going to be into taking a chance with you. And then that 60% in the middle may say, great, you know what, that might work. And then they'll, they'll join up with you. And, but go to where you're wanted. Have a team that is willing to be entrepreneurial. And, and they're going to, if you don't have the right team that's going to be fighting every step of the way, like an entrepreneur is creating the business, you're going to fail. So the people on your team that you're charging with trying to drive this change have to have that sort of personality, which in corporate America, there aren't a lot of those folks. Right. How do you, how do you find those folks? There aren't a lot of those folks. That's true. Many of them are here in the room. They're self-selected, and I think this is probably like therapy for them to be <laughs> here. But, but how do you find those people? You know, I, I, I don't remember who said, uh, you were saying, uh, Dan, about change. Eventually, they start to reveal themselves. Right? I mean, if you start going out and you're talking, but they're the people hanging out after the meeting. You know, they're the, and, they're, you know, and if you give them forms, like one of the things we created was just, a, um, again, when we looked at, when we did the crowdsourcing, we, were, we looked at who participated a lot. Who were the people that were in there throwing out ideas, iterating on other people's ideas? You can help find it that way. We set up a chatter site, and we thought, and we, so it helped us identify who were actually, is at 11 o'clock at night actually on that site? coming up with ideas and iterating on an idea, right? And those, then you start saying, oh, those are the people that either they'll reveal themselves directly to you or you can start finding them through these network analyses. I, I've always said, if you're the kind of person you want to find, they will find you. Hmm. If you're the kind of, say that again? Be the kind of person you want to find and they will find you. Ah, hmm. So if you're somebody, I mean, think about it. You know, you, you like to hang around people that are like you, right? So. If you're the kind of person who's innovative and not afraid of giving ideas and not afraid of speaking up, those are the kind of people who are going to seek you out, by definition, because that's, that's kind of the way people are. Well, the CIA might try and seek you out yeah. as well. <laughs> they might. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, uh, let me challenge this. I think there's a lot more innovative people in big organizations than people. Like, yeah. I mean, it, 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 right. it's this notion like, oh, big corporations are kind of this big bureaucracy. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's really true at, at the heart of it. Um, and it, it, it's a part of a conversation I had, you know, several years ago. I'm talking to folks in the lower levels of the organization, and they're complaining. It's like, how come management is so risk averse, and they're just not willing to take risks and jump on big ideas? And then I'm with the executive committee that afternoon, and the CEO says, how come we never see any bold ideas anymore? <laughs> Honest to goodness. Yeah. And it's like, something, something's right. goofy going on. Because, it's, because everybody's, and what happens, I think, is, 
people make assumptions about how risk averse senior management is and most of that time it's it's not true it really isn't true and it just, the conversation is not happening yeah. and so there's you know the number of innovative things if you if you open find ways to open up the communication conduits my experience in my organization there's a lot more innovative people all over the organization that just are waiting to get tapped well, there's good research that suggests that most people are actually quite creative if you give them the conditions and the opportunities to do so, but it's been driven out of us you know, because of the anvil on the head that Sonny mentioned earlier and early in my career experiences where people said, stick to your day job, you know, that's not what we're supposed to be doing here. Anna? I think there's another part of it. I, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of creativity in, in organizations. What I see happening is I think it's corporations make it too easy for people to be successful and not innovate. Okay? Ah, I, it's not a matter of, th there are anvils. I've had a few of those dropped on my head <laughs> myself. Um, th there are definitely anvils. But most of, the case, most of the time, corporations make it very easy for people to go to work every day and just kind of go through the motions and go home. And there's no consequence to not innovate. Whereas if you're in some organizations, it's kind of like the expectation to do it. Mm -hmm. And so how do you not only unleash you know, get rid of the anvils that fall on people's heads, but how do you actually make it uncomfortable for people to just take up space? I always say, you know, there's, there's a lot of people in companies of all sizes, not just corporations. A lot of people just go and take up space. Everybody here knows people that just show up to work every day and take up space, right? It's, it's too, if you've got They've that been edited out of rampant, the street, by the they're, they're not here. Yeah. You know people, they're not here. It, if it's rampant and you've got a big part of the population that's just there to take up space, it's kind of too easy, and you got to figure out how to make it uncomfortable for them. Yeah, great, great. Anna, that's a, I think it's a huge point, and Rob, you talk a lot about culture change. I mean, there, there are a lot of practices that I think make it easy not to innovate. I think about, um, and this is now my third corporation. I was at Citigroup before this and at Pfizer, and, and no fault. I mean, this is just the way it is. So many people would set their annual performance objectives or goals knowing exactly how they were going to accomplish yeah. them. Yeah. Budgets wouldn't be zero based, like you don't get any money this year until you tell me what you're going to do with it. It's what are you going to do with 3% more, right? Um, so I think practices like this, um, and, then, and then senior executives who I love that you just said the top three we're going to get going on. I think that's the other thing. S senior executives that say we want ideas but then don't actually get them. Yeah. And by the way, who cares if your top three didn't work or not? At least you tried, right? And you would have learned something from it or you demonstrated to the company that we're actually willing to, to take on new things. And if these three don't work, we'll take on the next three. So these, these just different perspectives and practices, I think, are so embedded in culture, we can't even see them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I would just add, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I think there's a lot of people who are willing to be creative and innovative. I was differentiating between these entrepreneurs that are kind of going to drive the change, um, which I think is harder to find. But I yeah. think the one thing I heard somebody say that I thought was really interesting was that, again, your employees are looking at you and seeing how you're spending your day. And if you're spending none of your day on thinking about yep. new ideas and innovation and creative, they're, they're going to be like, okay, that's not rewarded. So they, you know, if management doesn't set that example, they're not going to follow. So yep. it's really important for management to do it. Uh, one of the greatest things I saw at an Exelon Expo recently was Chris Crane, the CEO, was there. And he spent a couple hours walking around and talking to everybody about their projects. And it was one guy, Brian was sharing it earlier, who was, uh, it was, it was a crazy, can I say what it was? Fracking on the moon. <laughs> and he was serious about it. And he's thinking about what might this mean? What could it do in the long run? And you guys thought, gosh, should we edit that out? Or, yeah, oh, heck, let's, this is an expo. Let's let him share it. And you know, one of, the, one of the stations the CEO stopped at and talked to the guy for a while was the fracking on the moon guy. And all of a sudden, the fracking on the moon guy became a little bit of a celebrity inside <laughs> Exelon. So now other people are thinking about how do I frack on the moon, so to speak. <laughs> so, so it really is a motivating thing. Let's try a question from the audience. Lee. Anna, you touched on something relating to making things a little bit uncomfortable. And yet, change within an organization is difficult. And so can you talk a little bit about, any of the panelists, about how you try to integrate something that's changing from an innovation in your organizations where the team needs to find a way to adapt to that change? How do you ease the path 
reports change because otherwise you run into this cultural resistance that makes it fail. How do you, so is the question, Lee, how do you ease the path to change as a leader? Yes, please. For the teams themselves or for others in the company? Internal. Internal. Internal, inside the company. How do you ease the path to change? There are a lot of companies that have kind of skunk works groups. They have groups that they kind of draw a circle around and say, you know what, this is a group that we're going to expect some different things out of. And the way they do that is they change compensation in terms of how they're remunerated. They change um, timelines from short term to long term. You, you know, the things that motivate people to do what they do, if those fundamental things are not changed, you, 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 you know, you don't make it safe to do it. So I think that if you, if you can, you know, some companies have had a lot of success around creating kind of innovation groups um, within a large organization to try and, try and ignite ideas. Um, and that group, maybe is, is you know, uh, performance reviewed um, based on a different, different scheme. Um, and, and the expectations are different from leadership. So, you know, I, I'm a real believer that sometimes an organization needs to kind of create a, a safe space for a group of people to come up with some, some new things. Jeff, you're running a safe space like that right now. What, what works for you? Yeah, I think it is a, a little, so, so there, uh, so by the way, I'll just say, um, it ain't all rosy at Hyatt right now. Um, so I, I don't want to say like we've solved it and we figured it all out. In fact, if I'm really honest with you, I'm frustrated at the slow pace of change. Um, but, it's, but I'm starting to get it better now because there are so many things I think embedded in our operating culture. And I think it is an operating culture, by the way. Um, this is about how we've operated the company for so many years as opposed to really thinking about the experiences that we're providing for our guests. And, and so there, there are so many different dimensions of this that we have to change, and it's just going to take, take time. We can't do it all at once. We have to prioritize. Um, so we're, we're doing a variety of things. Um, and I think actually one of the most important things is, so, so many of our senior leaders, many of our general managers have been with our company for 30 years, 25, 30, 35 years. And I think it starts, and, and they're very um, well-intentioned leaders. And this is the way they've succeeded for years and years and years and years. And so part of it, I think, is changing the narrative to say, you know what, you have done a great job for all these years. And guess what? Our guests are changing. And our competitors are changing expectations. And it's kind of not fair, but that's the way it is. So uh, this whole idea of our core business isn't just to get a reservation right and put you in a room. Um, it's about a very different thing, and we have to rethink what our core business is. And you know what? We're not going to figure it out overnight. So I think a couple of things. One, to say you've done a great job for decades, and now we have to learn what leading in a different way is about, and we also realize it's going to take some time. And so um, it's okay to try stuff. It's okay to learn from failures. Um, and it's okay to share what you're learning with other people. And that's a, it's a very different way of having a conversation in an operating culture. Part of the, um, part of the making, making things, uh, you know, quote, safe for, for the organization is we spent some time um, having senior ownership all the way up to the CEO talking about things they screwed up along the way. Right. Um, and every one of them had a big long list of things that they tried and it went south. Um, and you know, part of our, one of our biggest failures as a corporation um, was we, we went into the detergent business for a while and ended up at the end of the day, we lost like $300 million in that project, which for us was a big lot of money. Um, and it the, is for us too, Dan. And the, <laughs> and the guy, you know, the, but, and everyone thinks it's like, oh, you know, if you try something and it fails, your career is done. And the guy who was general manager of that, in the division of that did that, became chief executive officer. Um, and so having the senior folks talk about stuff they screw up, it's like, it, 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 it's, and they all have lists. It does change the culture, which is like, hey, you know, you can, you, A, people at senior levels have screwed up along the way. B, there is no one there who has a track record of all successes. And it, 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 it gives people freedom to like, you know what, try it, and if it doesn't work, that's okay. 
But, but the, is it the CEO that really needs to set the tone for that kind of a conversation, or can it be done without a CEO that does that him or herself? I think it can be done without the CEO. Yeah? I mean, it, depend, again, it depends on the, the scale of change you're trying to make. It depends on how you're organized as a company, right? I, I remember when I was in finance, um, a bunch of the, uh, we got our, we do these employee engagement surveys, I'm sure everybody does that, and typically it's, it's the only, it's only survey you do where you ignore it after you do it, but, um, but you know, it's, it's typically, you know, it, and so it, it, everybody in finance is like, oh, the, the leadership in finance is like, oh, you know, we're waiting, our culture stinks, we really need to get a better culture, our CEO doesn't care about blah, 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 and our CFO looked at it all of us and he said, look, you each run your own areas, you have 100 to 500 people each, you can go do things in your area, don't wait for somebody to necessarily yeah. from on high tell you it's okay. So I think when you do that, you can go, you, you have a lot more freedom. It's kind of what Dan was saying earlier, just about um, this, this myth of uh, fear of failure, or this myth of uh, you're gonna get in trouble if you try to do something. I, I, I think a lot of times you can go do things in, in the world that you are kind of a part of that's within that bigger company and drive it. And then people may take notice and say, wow, that's the way you did it, and then all of a sudden, it grows, and then maybe you get CEO attention, maybe you get executive committee attention or whatever, but I don't think you have to wait. I, I, I think if you wait, you're gonna, you, I think that's on you if you wait. I think it also depends on the CEO. I think yeah. that there are some CEOs who are kind of, they cast a very big shadow across an organization, and if they're not, if it's not their idea, it's, it probably doesn't happen. I think, I think most importantly, a CEO, if a CEO doesn't drive it, a CEO has to support it, if it, happens. And I think that's, that's the most important thing. If you're not going to drive it, it's okay. But when you see it happening, you've got to support it. And, and support it, Anna, means actively and visibly support it. Actively, visibly. You've got to tell the story. You've got to let people know it's a great thing. You know, because to somebody's point here, when the CEO makes a comment, it's a big deal. The CEO stops by someone's station, it's, remembers their name. It's, it's kind, of, kind of cool. So, you know, that is a very important role. And so if, if you're not going to drive it, um, and, and in most cases where I found where it's most successful, the CEO does actually take a very active hand in it. But not all CEOs are like that. Some CEOs are very comfortable letting it happen, letting someone else start, start a great idea. But when it does happen, you've got to, you've got to support it. Dan? I, I, think, I think it's fair, it's, it's fair to say the CEO can't resist it. Or so yeah. so if, if they actually have a negative point of view, that does shut things down pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, we've got like 8,000 people, and the CEO has, you know, has interaction with so few of those people along the way that it's there's, there's a sense that the CEO is all powerful and, and I don't think that's really true. <laughs> um, a lot of stuff happens in the organization that can get they don't even necessarily have to support it visibly they can't resist it but little opportunities they have to support things are great but I wouldn't sit and wait for the CEO to do things necessarily because they, they just they have a lot less impact than I think that people will think. <laughs> so I, I'd like to transition for a few minutes to this, this larger question that I said we wouldn't spend much time on, but I'd like to spend a little bit of time on it because it sets up some of the conversations of the next two days. And that, that's, we've been talking about making change happen at a big organization, but what is the role of an organization like Hyatt or Clorox, Exelon, Willis Group in making change happen in the world? Uh, certainly, we all need to make money. If we don't make money, then we're out of business and we don't have Kin Global. So, <laughs> great. But what is the role of corporations in making change happen in the world? How do we delineate that? Jeff. So, this has been part of our, you, you, several of you mentioned it depends, um, the CEO's role in this depends on how broad the ambition is. And I would say in this case, so our CEO is Mark Koplanasian. Uh, Sonny know, knows him well, um, and an incredible leader, and kind of to this idea of you don't need the CEO to get started. Um, innovation started in pockets in our company, in some of these lab hotels and other places, and I think it was actually some of those early efforts that caused Mark as our CEO to start thinking very differently about what our company could become. And that's led us to this, you know, there's really, um, nothing short of a cultural transformation that we have to undertake that Mark needs to lead. 
and a part of this process was a year ago, um, Mark really saying, well, what, you know, it's sort of the ultimate why question. Why do we exist as a company? Right. And, and, and what it led him to the dis conclusion was we're more than a hotel company, we're more than a hospitality company, that actually we should exist in the world to care for the human spirit. Now, you can imagine people were saying, well, you're being all religious and stuff. And, and he said, but, you know, think about it. Even in our hotels, when people are away from home, um, yeah, they need a clean bed. Yeah, they need a reservation that's right. But, but people travel, and they're worried, and they show up for business, and they want the business meeting to go well. Or they're traveling on a vacation with their family, and they want it to be a really memorable time. And, and this is the domain of, of sort of emotions. And and motivations, and how could we care for people, um, and then how does that extend um, in, into a broader mission? And these things, as Mark is finding, and we're now on this journey of sort of leading with this higher purpose of care, um, opens up so many different doors. So, you know, part of our financial success as a company is to open many more hotels in growing markets, like Brazil, like China, like India. Part of what we realize is that there isn't yet a fully trained hotel staff that we can hire to work to provide care. So what we're finding is we have to actually reach out in communities even before we open hotels to actually provide education, to provide internships so that we can actually start building the staff. And there's a, a really nice economic um, cycle that starts happening where everybody benefits from that. So we're early in the journey, but for us this idea of why do we exist and there must be a higher purpose and it's caused us to think much more outside of the walls, the four walls of our hotel and to the surrounding communities. So this is kind of unfair, Jeff, but I, I remember when you were at Kellogg with your team from Hyatt, uh, here in this building actually, and, and you shared that mission and I thought that's really inspiring. It, it's a little crazy, but it's inspiring. How does it operationalize? What, what does that really mean? Are we just saying it, it feels good? But what is that, what's something that makes you do differently, if yeah. that's your mission? So I'll give you a really practical example. And, and by the way, so what it does, and you know, probably all of you are familiar with this thing, that um, there are nearer in innovations or changes that you could do within, say, an operating year. Other things are going to take two, three, four years, particularly if they're very, very different. Um, so there are a number of those sort of further out things that we're pursuing. Uh, but I'll give you one really practical example. This, and in fact, one of the teams, so um, we partner with Kellogg and Rob um, and Mohan and others on um, 25 emerging enterprise leaders every year coming here and thinking about enterprise-wide responsibility, not just their function. And, and Mark came and gave it a challenge, and they always take on an innovation challenge. How could we share the care? How could we express care outside of a hotel stay? And one of the ideas that came back is we have this gold passport, our loyalty program. Some of you are probably with Starwood and Hilton Honors. Um, but we only think about you as a loyal guest when you're staying away from home at one of our hotels. We don't think about you in your hometown. So for those of you that are Hyatt Gold Passport members that live in the Chicago area, we don't think about you. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, Thanks, sorry, nice. yeah, there it is. <laughs> and so one of the teams said, how could we actually reach out to you in your hometown? I mean, things happen that we're equipped to deal with every day. Maybe there's an emergency. Maybe there's a special wine and cheese event we're having. Maybe there's a sort of a celebrity chef that's coming that we could invite you to at the Park Great. Hyatt. So how do we actually start expressing care to you in your hometown even when you're not staying with us? Great. So this is an example of how this is actually just starting to cause us to think very, very differently. Great. Anybody else? No requirement to respond. I, Anna. I think it's. I, I think going beyond kind of how you your relationship with your customers and all that. I think it's really important for corporations to to pause and talk about their purpose in the world. Okay. Uh, yeah. Obviously, it's easy. You know, when you talk about oil companies, you kind of say it's all about the planet. It's about making sure you do things as green as you can and all that. So it's easy for you know maybe for natural resources companies to kind of get there. Uh, and, and talk about the planet. I actually also think about, you know, larger causes. Like, you know, what are you doing f to, to create this uh, a viewpoint that working for a corporation is not a bad thing? I, I don't know about you guys. I have a hard time mentoring young kids these days who say, all right, tell me what I can do, but one thing I don't want to do is I don't want to work with a corporation. 
And I said, why not? Because corporations are bad. And so, how, boy, how do we get here, right? We got here because we haven't spent time doing what you're talking about. We haven't actually spent time, you know, you know, kind of ruminating in this, in this whole idea of purpose beyond just kind of what is feeding the P&L. And I actually think in order to continue to have the permission to operate in society, corporations need to spend time marinating in this idea of what are we here for and what good are we doing for people and the world and the business world and, and all that stuff. I think, it's, I think it's vitally important because we are losing a lot of people being interested in, in what we're doing. And by the way, and I hate to cut this off, but in time we, we need to, this is one of the core missions that I see. It's under the table mission for Kin. Because I, I never wanted us to be just the place where we come and talk about cool, neat stuff where everybody feels good about being good people. But we've got to do some more to engage the public dialogue to help people understand that we all fail if our corporations, if our private sector fails. And that our private sector needs to make money. And we can do good by doing well. And how do we figure that out? So I, I couldn't agree more. I always learn a lot when I'm on a panel. And here's one thing that struck me. Every one of our panelists use crazy words, like paint a picture, like you have to be emotional. I heard something about love from Mark Sarangelo, and I'm still waiting to hear more from an engineer about love. But you know, these, these things are, are real. These are the things that move people's hearts and their checkbooks and everything else, in fact. So Anna, you, as, as always, had lots of great things to say. You may make it too easy to be successful and not innovate. And you know, in a context which we had for a long time where you could kind of just do well what you've been doing for 30 years, that works. That doesn't work anymore is the problem. And we've got 30 years to prove that that old thing we used to do actually worked for 30 years, but it doesn't work anymore, and that's the problem. You said paint a picture of what the world could look like. You said change perspective, and that's something we have to do actively. And it's tough. You can't just make an argument. So many executives say to me, at my company we make decisions based on data. And I say, which data? And how are you interpreting it? You mentioned this, the, the confirmation bias, selection bias, all these biases we bring with us that cause us to make decisions on data that might not be the right decisions. And uh, Sonny, you need a personal narrative. Now you're somebody who spent some time at the White House and think about these sort of public, public persona in a very practical way. I think everyone in the room needs to think about their personal narrative. We're going to talk a little bit about that later on when you share your mission with four other people in the room. What is that narrative? And loud statements of change. It cannot just be a memo. It has to be loud, impactful. It has to be something that touches people, that emotional side. And go where you're wanted. Dan, you said something interesting I've seen many, many times. You might think that that person doesn't like what you're doing, and maybe they're actually your biggest, biggest supporter. They haven't stepped up yet. Or you might think the person who smiles and nods at the staff meeting is on your side, and in fact, they can't wait for you to fail. So you've got to figure out how to make that happen. Dan, you said, what are we not going to do? Why don't we talk about failure? We have to talk about failure, especially the higher you go in the organization. It's only you that can enable that conversation to happen. And you said again, connecting. An emotional connection between human beings is what motivates people. And get it started. Jeff, you talked about why do we exist? What is the purpose? That's certainly true for corporations. It's also true for us individually. And it reminds me of a, of a panel I moderated with my good friend and Kenny and Dennis Brown, who's sitting right up there. I'm going to embarrass you for a second, Dennis. Dennis is in charge of Imagineering for SAP a big Germanic software company. If you think your job is tough, try Dennis's job. And he's had some great success with quite a few slings and arrows. And what struck me in this regard is we were on a panel maybe five or six years ago talking about the role of business. And Dennis had been an entrepreneur out in Silicon Valley, built things, independent, dynamic. And now he's at this big sclerotic Germanic company. And we said, why'd you stay? And he said, you know, because when you get that battleship to move, it can do more than any independent entrepreneur for, in men, most cases can do. It's extraordinary what you can do when you can move the battleship. And that's our objective. The thing that causes that to stick with me is when he stated this, being a good Irishman, Dennis teared up. 
that's how much emotion there was behind making this stuff happen. Thanks a lot to the panelists for a fantastic panel.